Hi everybody, my name is Katie and I'm going to be talking about temporal lobe epilepsy and religious personality. So um, in chapter 9 of our textbook, Ramachandran talks about a patient he once had named Paul. He writes, um, Paul seemed to see himself as an expert witness called to offer testimony about himself and his relationship with God. He was intense and self-absorbed and had all the arrogance of a believer none of the humility of the deeply religious. Um, so I found this really interesting. Um, and one of the things that Ramachandran talks about in the book is that um, what's physically happening with temporal epilepsy, with these repeated seizures, is a process called kindling. So um, what kindling does is it, um, it means that the seizures that are happening here they, they create kind of a beaten path for the electrical stimulation to follow. So subsequent seizures are more likely to also follow that path. You know, they might branch out a little bit, but for the most part, they're gonna keep to that beaten trail. Um, what this does is it augments those brain regions. And in temporal lobe epilepsy, it's, what it's augmenting is the emotional centers, um, creating kind of a hyper-emotionality usually in these patients. Um, so why then do these patients, such as Paul, become religious personalities, even when they're not having seizures in the moment? You know, what is it about that hyper-emotionality that persists, that makes them so sure that they have communed with God? Um, Ramachandran offers four possibilities, the first of which, super simple, maybe God really does visit these people. Maybe temporal lobe epileptics are the chosen ones. They have the neural circuitry God needs to talk to them. You know, maybe there is a God. The second possibility is that um, living with this hyper-emotionality is very chaotic um, and very uh, exhausting and that these patients seek peace through religion. Religion is known to be very harmonizing. Um, there are a lot of health benefits associated with following a particular religion, knowing what to do with your life. And so for someone who's experiencing this, you know, hyper-emotionality, religion might just be what they fall into. It's the only thing that works. Um, the third possibility is that um, augmented connections through these seizures between the sensory centers of the brain and uh, the emotional centers of the brain mean that um, these patients are perceiving external events, external stimuli as more emotionally significant than they would have previously. They're experiencing things as very profound all of a sudden, touched by you know, some divine light. And the fourth, and what Ramachandran considers the most speculative of the possibilities that he writes about is that we've actually evolved um, neural circuitry for religion over time. So this, uh, this discussion of have we evolved religion into our brains um, is where neurotheology comes in. Neurotheology is concerned with describing the human tendency for religion and religious myths through scientific means. Um, so it really likes this explanation, you know, it takes for granted that evolutionary alteration in the structure of the brain does account for the development of religion in our species. Um, interestingly, it also, neurotheology, also um, talks about how there isn't, you know, as we've evolved, we didn't evolve a, a nucleus, a point that is religious in the brain. You know, you can't point at it and say, that's, that's God, right there. Um, but rather, it's a, a network, um, like the default network. It's a distribution of brain areas that all contribute in unique ways um, for the propagation of spiritualistic feelings, you know, thoughts, visions, this kind of thing. Um, so, Jeshwind is um, a scientist who actually coined the term Jeshwin syndrome, which um, is just that. It's what Paul would have been diagnosed with, you know, in Ramachandran's text. Um, it is 
simply following temporal lobe seizures, a subject that tends toward hypergraphia, hyperreligiosity, reduced sexual interests, fainting spells, and pedantism. Um, so, you know, Ramachandran had a lot of questions about about this, but he never really put a name to it. This fellow, Norman Jeshwind, um, coined the syndrome Jeshwind syndrome. Um, so there will be a number of case studies that I refer to in class when I have a little bit more time to talk about this, much like Paul. But um, one of the um, studies that I found most interesting in doing my research was by a fellow named Persinger. Um, so Persinger decided to try and uh, study this, but in a controlled setting, um, not with case studies of temporal of epileptics, but just trying to find religion, understand religion in the brain in normal human beings. So what he did in his experiment was he blocked um, visual and auditory sensory information um, so that the person couldn't see or hear anything. And then he used electrodes to provide electrical stimulation to both hemispheres of the brain. What he found was that when it reached the limbic system, um, the uh, subject um, reported feelings of physical distortion and hyperemotionality, um, which many of them then interpreted to be uh, touched by God. Um, so what Persinger then uh, reasoned was that it was a, mis a misattribution of some inner voice, you know, what they perceived as a touch by God or hearing God's voice was, you know, misat misattributed, misattributed, there we go. Um, and that actually what was happening was that the restriction of sensory information uh, was being imparted onto Broca's area, resulting in a misjudgment of where that voice, where those profound feelings were coming from. Um, so this is what my research turned up. There's definitely room for more. It's a really fascinating field, but thank you for listening to what I've got so far.